Today what I would like to do is discuss the issue of eternal security, and before I even get into the heart of this message, let me give Charles Stanley's definition of eternal security. Stanley said this, quote, Eternal security is that work of God in which he guarantees that the gift of salvation once received is possessed forever and cannot be lost, unquote. His definition fits with what many other people have written about eternal security, once saved, always saved, and the perseverance of the saints. And make no mistake about it, even though some people might try to say the perseverance of the saints is not the same as eternal security, don't believe it. The bottom line is, these groups out there believe that once you become a son, you always remain a son of God, and that can never change, no matter what you do or don't do. No matter what kind of belief you would accept or reject, you're always going to remain a son of God once you become a son of God, once you become regenerated. Today I would like to get into the issue of is eternal security another gospel or is it the real gospel? In the book of Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. The Apostle Paul here is referring to a false gospel called another gospel in the King James Bible. That means it is a counterfeit gospel. It's not the real gospel that he proclaimed. And notice, back then in his day, the counterfeit was even around then. How much more should we know? Certainly, without doubt, there are false gospels around today. And there are many of them. What I would like to do is discuss this issue, as Charles Stanley defined, the idea that once you receive the gift of salvation, it is possessed forever and it cannot be lost. That is what I want to focus in upon. I would like you please to listen to what else Charles Stanley and others have said about this doctrine called eternal security. Charles Stanley said this, quote, The very gospel itself comes under attack when the eternal security of the believer is questioned, unquote. Stanley also said, quote, The very foundations of Christianity begin to crumble once we begin tampering with the eternal security of the believer, unquote. As I mentioned before, he's not alone in making statements like this. Here's a quote from John Ankerberg, quote, Eternal security is one of those outstanding glories of the Christian gospel, unquote. Mr. Jim White said this, quote, One must believe in the perseverance of the saints if one is to accurately present the gospel of grace. To do anything else is to edit the gospel, unquote. Virgin said this, quote, Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else, unquote. If you're acquainted with the Bible, you know that statement is false. All five points of Calvinism are unscriptural. And the most deadly of the five points would be the fifth point, which they call the perseverance of the saints. I have a quote from Robert Morey regarding eternal security, and he said this, quote, The eternal security of the believer arises out of the necessity and nature of the atonement, unquote. Charles Ryrie said this, quote, What grace it is that can give us not only forgiveness and eternal life through faith alone, but also guarantee that the giver will never renege on his gift, nor can we give it back even if we try, unquote. Robert Thame said this, quote, Once a son, always a son. Once you're born into the family of God, you will always be a member of the family of God. You cannot change your spiritual birth any more than you can change your physical birth. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you were born into the family of God. At that point, you became a child of God, and for all eternity, you will remain a child of God. This is the grace of God. There is nothing you can do to alter it, unquote. Last, but certainly not least, let me give you a quote from the early 1600s from the Calvinistic Synod of Dort, which is under their doctrine of the perseverance. Article 15 states this, quote, The carnal mind is unable to comprehend this doctrine of the perseverance of the saints and the certainty thereof which God has most abundantly revealed in his word for the glory of his name and the consolation of pious souls and which he impresses upon the hearts of believers. Satan abhors it. The world ridicules it. The ignorant and hypocritical abuse it and the heretics pose it. But the bride of Christ has always most tenderly loved and constantly defended it, unquote. So according to all these statements, amazing, incredible, even ludicrous statements have been made about this teaching that once you get saved, you always remain saved. This foundational Christianity, it's connected with the gospel, it's connected with grace, it's connected with the atonement, and much worse than that. Heretics oppose that kind of teaching. Well, they didn't go into detail, so I will. They are actually saying 
that regardless what type of sin you may stray into, it doesn't matter how grievous that sin may be to God. It makes no difference. You will always remain saved. I'd like to share something else that's very relevant to this message. Because this thing called eternal security has been connected with the very gospel itself, as well as grace and other important terms such as that. What we now have are two gospel messages. If I ask the question, which gospel do you believe in? Hopefully you can understand what I mean by that statement. Let me describe eternal security in a different way than Charles Stanley put it a little bit ago as I quoted him. If you would analyze the teaching of eternal security, you would find out this is what they're saying. Salvation begins in a moment's time and is guaranteed to continue on. Next, there is no salvation maintenance on man's part. The loving God will keep you, hold you, and has you sealed forever, which will assure your entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Thirdly, they teach that sin can never bring a true Christian to a spiritual death, regardless of what type of sin that may be, or neither can any false doctrine cause loss of salvation. Four, eternal life is a gift that cannot be lost or returned, and also a present tense possession for the Christian, guaranteeing an entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Five, reaching heaven for the Christian is just as certain as though he has already been in heaven for 10,000 years. Six, this is the sticky one. There are some Christians that are adulterers, some Christians that are drunkards, some Christians that are thieves, murderers, suicides, etc., now, that's their gospel. That's what they connect with grace, foundational to Christianity. And they say at times that heretics oppose that sort of message. Well, if it's a heretic that opposes that sort of message, I must be a heretic. And let me go on record as saying I am glad I am a heretic if that is what a heretic is. After reading the scriptures for over 25 years, let me tell you what I found the message of the Bible to be regarding the real gospel which the Apostle Paul preached and he defended Listen to the contrasting points. According to the Bible, salvation begins in a moment's time, and it will continue on, but only as long as we believe and follow Jesus. This implies the possibility that something can adversely interfere with it, as has happened numerous times in the past in the lives of other people that were truly regenerated. People such as Solomon, Saul, the apostle Judas Iscariot, and many others. My second point is, after getting born again, which is really initial salvation, because the Bible also teaches there is a final salvation, that's an entrance into the kingdom of God. But after getting born again, there is salvation maintenance on man's part, which is all under biblical grace. If this salvation maintenance on man's part is neglected, the Christian will inevitably drift away, turn lukewarm, grow unfruitful, become unloving and unforgiving, as well as regress spiritually in other ways, even to the point that his spiritual life is no longer present within his spirit anymore like it was in the past. Man's cooperation with God enables him to keep and hold us spiritually safe. In other words, when man and only when man cooperates with God, can God then keep and hold us in a safe spiritual way. And even though God is sovereign, he will never violate man's free will, even if it is to man's detriment and damnation. Christians can put to death the misdeeds of the sinful nature of the flesh by the Spirit of God, never by their own ability or strength. The third point I'd like to magnify as being the teaching of the Bible on salvation is sin can defile, corrupt, contaminate soil and even bring a true Christian to his spiritual death. The seal of the Holy Spirit can be broken. Consequently, we must be on our spiritual guard at all times as we look to God for His strength and His power. The Christian life is a war, a fight, and a struggle against the deceiving forces of darkness and personal sin. Point four, eternal life is much more than just a gift and a present tense possession. It is also a hope, Titus 3, 7, a promise, 1 John 2, 24 and 25, yet to be reaped, Galatians 6, 8 and 9, in the age to come, Mark 10.30, but only for those who persist in doing good, Romans 2.7, and don't grow weary and give up sowing to please the Spirit of God and not the sinful nature, Galatians 6.8 and 9. Point five, the only salvation assurance the Bible offers is a present tense salvation assurance for the person who is presently following Jesus and trusting in Him for his own personal salvation based on 1 John 5, 11 through 13. In other words, the faith needed to enter God's paradise kingdom is a trusting, submitting, and enduring faith. 
To enter God's kingdom, we must endure hardships and persecutions as we continue to live holy as Jesus' disciples in this wicked and adulterous generation. But sadly, continuing in the faith and holiness has not always happened to others in times past. And by that I mean other Christians. The sixth point. It is absolutely impossible to be a Christian at the same time as being an adulterer, a drunkard, a thief, a murderer, or any of the others that might be cited in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Revelation 21, 8, Ephesians 5, 5 through 7, Mark 7, 20 through 22. To teach that such is possible is to twist the holy image of being a Christian, that is a saint, into something which allows for wickedness. Eternal security, therefore, is a dangerous myth which has many on the road to hell thinking they are on the road to heaven because they once had a moment of true faith which brought them regeneration. I mentioned before, man has his own role in maintaining his salvation with the Lord. While salvation is from the Lord, and we're saved by grace and not by works, and we are not under the law, we are told many other things in the Bible that would be flatly denied by people that are teaching a perverted grace and a perverted gospel. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus said, Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Jesus said in Luke 12:35, Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Now whose responsibility is it to keep the Christian's lamp burning? Is it God's responsibility or is it the Christian's responsibility? Well, according to this verse, it has to be the Christian's responsibility. And would you believe there are many other scriptures just like that? Consider Romans 12:11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. God wants us to be hot for Him and not lukewarm. It's up to us to keep our own spiritual fervor and not cool down and even die out. The Apostle Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 5:22, Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Now, he knew that God was able to keep and to hold and to strengthen and that Timothy was sealed by the Holy Spirit because Timothy had been saved. But nonetheless, he told Timothy, Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Hebrews 12:12. 12, 12. Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Notice that. It is your responsibility to spiritually strengthen yourself according to this passage. We'll be right back. Evangelical Outreach is a non-compromise ministry dedicated to the proclamation and defense of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you join us in the fight and help us to win souls to Jesus? Send your check today to Evangelical Outreach, Post Office Box 265, Washington, Pennsylvania, 15301. Now listen to what James had to say about all of this. James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James' definition of Christianity, and that's really the religion that God would consider pure and acceptable to him, includes the Christian keeping himself unspotted from the world. We are told to come out from the world, resist the devil, and crucify the flesh. But the way eternal security is taught, that's legalism if you try to do anything. But notice, that's not how James taught would you believe that the Bible teaches that we are to make it an absolute priority in our Christian walk to put forth a constant agonizing effort to enter the kingdom's door? In Luke chapter 13, 23, a person asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? And verse 24 is most important. Jesus answered that with these words. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. He said, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Well, Jesus is the ultimate authority. And if he said there's going to be many that are going to try to get in the kingdom of God and won't be able to get there because they didn't put forth enough effort, that says to me that we better be putting forth, as he said, every effort to get in. If not, we might be one of the many that don't get in the kingdom's doors. 
By the way, the same word that is rendered agony or agonizing is found in this passage. Jesus is saying, make a continuous agonizing effort to get in the kingdom doors. Peter told his readers that we need to be alert and self-controlled because the devil prowls around throughout the earth seeking whom he can devour. That was written to Christians. Peter wanted Christians to know the devil wants to devour you and he will unless you are alert and self-controlled. To be alert means so that you won't be deceived by a false teacher, a false prophet. Somebody claiming to be something that they're not, allegedly preaching a gospel that's really not the gospel at all. Be alert. Learn the scripture. Study the Bible for yourself and go by the message of the Bible over any other thing. A vision, a dream, a prophecy, a teaching, even if it would come from somebody on TV, the radio, or in a book. Jesus wasn't joking when he said, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Listen to what else the Bible has to say about grace, because all of this is grace. The whole New Testament is grace teaching. Jesus said this to the Jews who had believed him. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Notice that it's our responsibility to hold to his teaching. He went on in that same chapter and said that the truth will set you free. Jesus is the truth and he will set us free from the slavery of sin. Many other times that sort of teaching is found, especially in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Not legalism, grace. Not a false gospel, the true gospel. In other words, you're going to get in the kingdom if you hold on to the very end. The same confidence you had when you just started your walk with God. Consider what Jesus said after his death, burial, and resurrection. Revelation 3.11 Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. It's a little choppy, a little archaic from the King James, but nonetheless, the point is clearly made. It's our responsibility, even after Jesus paid the infinite work with his own blood on the cross. He's telling Christians, you hold fast to what you already have, so that no man will take your crown. Nobody leading you into temptation. Nobody leading you astray doctrinally. In other words, as Peter said, be alert and self-controlled. Again, brothers and sisters, those of you that are real Christians, listen to me. Get in the scriptures. Believe the message of the Bible. The Bible says there are people that are going to change grace into a license for immorality. And that's not all. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote this Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to mythology. The Bible actually says the time will come. That people are going to hear the word of God preached and actually turn away from it. And they're going to seek out teachers, plural teachers, to say what their sinful, itching ears want to hear. They're going to look for somebody to tell them that it's okay to go ahead and commit adultery and get drunk. To be a thief and a liar and to do all other forms of wickedness. And you're still going to get into the kingdom of God when the Bible teaches something absolutely positively different. They're going to seek out these teachers, plural. If you were looked that up in the Greek... It can be rendered doctors. They're going to seek out doctors to say what their itching ears want to hear. Slick talkers. Impressive kind of people. People that seem well versed. Perhaps people with a large following. Maybe they're on TV. Maybe they've written 10, 15, 25, 30, 40 books. People are going to turn their ears from the truth. And they're going to turn aside. We're talking about people that knew the truth. They're going to turn aside to these false teachers that are going to proclaim doctrinal mythology. A religious myth. Not the message of Jesus and his apostles. But certainly they're going to use religious terms. And if the devil can quote scripture, and he can, we better know that the devil's servants can also do the same. So the Bible teaches most definitely what the gospel is. Listen to what Paul said in a nutshell what the gospel is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 1 all the way on down to verse 4, 
This is what Paul said about the gospel. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I have received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And it goes on that he was seen by a number of different people. But the point is, verse 2 tells us there's a conditional security for the believer in Christ, which is often overlooked, perhaps intentionally, by the eternal security teachers to describe the gospel from the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2 says this, By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Paul wanted these people to know, even though they were saved by grace and sealed by the Holy Spirit, even though they were not under the law and that they're justified by faith, that it would be possible for them to come to the place where they have believed in vain, that their believing in Jesus was futile, that is, if they turned to another gospel. And don't say it can't happen. That's the very thing that was going on at the very beginning of Galatians chapter 1. They were turning to another gospel, and Paul was astonished at what was happening there. And that's where he said that if anybody preach another gospel other than what he has proclaimed, let that person be accursed or anathema, or eternally condemned. So it's a very serious thing, according to the Bible, to claim to be preaching and handling the true plan of salvation, but not be declaring the plan of salvation that will get people into the kingdom of God. In a nutshell, what must you do to get into the kingdom of God? You must have a trusting, submitting, and enduring faith in Jesus. Church membership cannot save you. The sacraments cannot save you. Water baptism cannot save you. Saturday Sabbath keeping cannot save you. But Jesus can. The Bible teaches Jesus is the Savior. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man will come to the Father but by Him. He is the only mediator between God and man. And it's not Jesus and Mary. It's Jesus. Jesus is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Not Mary. And as you read through the Bible, you will see many other relevant things to all of this. And once you get on the road to life, Jesus said elsewhere, trouble will come your way. You will be persecuted. It's a difficult road that leads to life. And few there will be that will actually get into the kingdom as far as the overall populace. By the droves, people will be deceived by false teachers. Religious deception is one of the characteristics of the end times according to what Jesus and his apostles taught. There is a vast apostasy taking place. A very, very dark hour is this one in which we are now living. And brothers and sisters, it's actually going to get worse. Those of you that are true brothers and sisters, let me encourage you with these words. Better days are ahead for the true saint, but not in this life. Keep your eyes on Jesus and your hand to the plow and don't look back. Stay in the Bible. Read it as a lawyer would read a document, a deposition, to find out specifically what it is saying. Your eternal destiny hinges on what you do with the message of the Bible. Read it and act upon it. It doesn't do any good at all just reading it or hearing it preached as you just heard from me. You need to turn from wickedness. Sin will drag you to hell. And unless you repent, you will perish. You must turn from those idols, and you turn from the idols to serve the true and the living God. This is not a game. This is not a dry run. This is not a test run. This is not a drill. This is not a practice. This is for keeps. What you are doing or refusing to do will affect you throughout all eternity. If you have been slothful and wicked, it's time to repent. Do it now. There is no guarantee you're going to be around even another day. With all the diseases and all the horrible things that we read about all the time and hear about that are happening all over the world, maybe the next time somebody dies, it could be you. Maybe the next time you get in a car, that might be your last car ride. But let me say this, sooner or later, something is going to happen and we will die. Death will overtake us all. But what about the judgment and eternity? That depends on what you do with the Bible. Without question, every single person that has died... If they could carry a message back to us today, it would be this. Believe and act on the Bible because it's true. Now, I am not saying that we can contact the dead. I don't believe that, so don't misunderstand what I just said a moment ago. I said if they could get back to us, if they could speak to us, that is the message they would want us to know. That is, if they wanted us to know the truth and if they loved us and cared about us. Such we find in Luke 16, the man that died and he went to the fires of Hades. 
and he was concerned about his five brothers that were in sin and knew they needed to repent. And he wanted to get a message back to them of repentance. That is the message of the Bible. Friends, again, focus your trust for your salvation in upon Jesus. He is your only hope of escaping eternal damnation. If you escape damnation, it will be because of Jesus and His precious blood that was shed on the cross. And Paul preached that, but he also said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2, By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. May you never forget that it is possible to believe in vain. So there is free will and human responsibility on the part of the Christian after he starts on the road to life. Can you imagine what it would be like to die and to go to hell? Try to imagine the regret and deep anguish for those who wake up in this horrible place prepared for the devil and his angels. As bad as that will be, even a greater surprise is awaiting the ones who believe in the security in sin gospel, commonly called eternal security. They died in a lost condition. They thought even for years that they would most assuredly go to heaven after their death because they were once saved. But instead, they go to hell. This is how it will be for multitudes. Will you help us reach these and others before it's eternally too late? Please visit our website at www.evangelicaloutreach.org.